Hey everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the Snapchat. I'm joined today by none other than Cozy Snap. Cozy, Mockingbird released this week, and you know what? Thankfully, it came out just in time to help Thanos out after the time still got nerfed. I can't even finish the statement. I can't even finish the sentence, Cozy. Did Thanos actually need Mockingbird? Hit us with your thoughts. I know it's it's like they changed Pixie not to work with Thanos, and you thought there would be some way. The wordage per game that prides itself on being like simplistic. There are just some things that are so wonky and, and Thanos and his stones in his deck, but they're not because they're not at the start of the game. So Loki can't copy him. And now Mockingbird can take advantage. And it, it is, it's, it's a bummer because uh, we got a lot to break down about her, but some of the best things I like about her ultimately just worked better in Thanos because of the way the deck worked. That is exactly my feeling too. I actually really like the card and I've not even been playing her in Thanos, honestly. Like I've been playing her everywhere else. But everyone I know is playing her in Thanos, right? And uh, it got to the point that even at some of the uh, competitive tournaments we're seeing, people are playing Thanos with Mockingbird, but they know they're going to be mirror matching against Thanos Mockingbird. So they're including Mobius and Mobius into their lineup in order to counter the, it is like, okay, you're just trying to stop them from doing what you're doing yourself. It is like this total mind game with Mockingbird. And it's a damn shame because the card definitely did not need Thanos. Right? And he had so many different things that it did well, but it's being shoehorned directly into Thanos. And I kind of felt bad because I don't think it's actually a Thanos card. You know, here's the thing. I think when I when uh, she came out, I kind of talked about all the cards that you could cheat out. And really, let's look at like Scar, She-Hulk, and her. Okay, When you're trying to do what you're already trying to do in a deck, the card is good. Because of She-Hulk, she's a great card because she's working so well. Scar, you kind of have to pigeonhole a little bit of what's going on. That's what kind of bumps him down. Mockingbird, like you're just doing what you do just fine in most of the decks she's going to be played in. And that's why it's great because you're just getting good value. And even if she's not discounted, she's 9 F in power. But in Thanos, it's even more of a degree to that, right? Because you're begging to play out. Like in a, in a Patriot deck, you don't have to play Brood all the time. On that turn, there's maybe another option. In Thanos, you want to play the Mind Stone. Oh, you get two more cards to be able to discount. It's just this like a huge kind of snowball that gets out of control. Yeah. And like... Honestly, she's running a 34% meta share right now. So people picked up on the fact that this card so was bad. good. 54% win rate, solid cube rate. The card is just phenomenal. And that's all post infinite stats, by the way. So it is crushing statistically. And um, it's a shame because it's almost exclusively being played in Thanos. But both of us discussed non Thanos versions on last week's Snapchat. In fact, both of us released guides that did not have Thanos at all. And you know what, Cozy? I gotta I gotta give you credit because I got called out. I got called out hard and people were like, Alex, last week on the Snapchat, you said, you said, Alex, that Cozy was huffing hopium when he said Debris was gonna be a good card with Mockingbird. And then sure enough, I'm laying in bed that night and I'm thinking to myself, I think Cozy's right. I think Debris might actually be good. And I released a video with Debris in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And it was you? good. It was good. I liked it a lot. I, she, uh, again, what we opened up with, right? Like, she is great. She's best in Thanos. So the other decks, like, you're like, man, she could be better here. But yeah, dude, there's, she had more synergy than I give her credit for. And I, I'm really happy that the cable uh, ended up coming and get his adjustment because that was another card that can, like, you know, work in the blend of it all. It, listen, it did what it did. Patriot was great with it. And it felt like a strong Patriot card. And it also feels like a great Moon Girl card. We kind of hit the nail right on that damn head when we talked about the synergies last week and we pointed out most of the ones that 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 hit uh that hit big it kind of made me wonder though and i i'm okay we both like patriot you're a huge pa patriot truther i kind of felt like patriot itself that archetype needs something like it like mockingbird added a vertical element to it but patriot felt like it was hard to, it couldn't compete with the helidex it couldn't compete with thanos it couldn't compete with power the way some of these other decks are doing it seems like marvel snap has just evolved far enough where classic patriots is not doing it anymore. and i think that's what was a bummer because it was a great card for patriot but it was a better card for thanos and then it's like oh bummer i needed this card for patriot to compete with thanos but now it has the card too so what do i do the thing is the Patriot deck, right? Because I went back and looked and I, and I don't, I think deck ownership, I'm not big on deck ownership and all that. But what I did see is when I was looking at the stats to to, to compare my Mockingbird Patriot to uh, uh, my other super giant Patriot deck, 61% win rate, 6,000 games played. Very proud of where that one is standing at. And the only reason that's so competitive at the moment is because it's not trying to go big. You're just the priority king. It's so good at early power. And then you go with a super giant or an alive play. Like that is what the deck, that's the only way. 
the deck can compete because if everything pops off in that deck right everything you need to have patriot surfer down you need to have the absorbing man on the brute you're looking at like 21 to 24 best case scenario with a double abs man pop kind of stuff and there's decks i can even beat that pretty easily it's a great wide deck not a really good tall deck and i thought maybe mockingbird would help it does but to our point thanos it helped more exactly like and even to that extent like tribunal surpasses that almost very consistently right and uh, another archetype which is worth bringing up here is zoo mockingbird helped zoo a lot like yeah. legitimately like yeah, zoo yeah, for sure. uh, is running about a 53 percent win rate range like not great but it's zoo damn it and mockingbird was great there because you see dazzler you see sean a squirrel girl and others and um but still like the major problem with zoo is you go really wide but you're not vertical enough and mockingbird added that verticality but it's just not enough because you work so hard to get Mockingbird out and all these combinations, and then they discard uh, Infinite, right? And Infinite just lands 20 power with Hella, and you're like, well, okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what do you even do? So I really like the card. I just, it was so unfortunate to me, as we've alluded to, that it helped Thanos too. Like, it really did not need to help the number one deck in the game. Well, it's funny is if it didn't help Thanos, the number one deck, it helped the number two deck. And I, I would argue it's close to as good as Thanos, and that's the Loki build. And I, and I think that the stats may not be there. I don't really care. I think Loki is a tougher card, uh, stat wise, to look at. I don't always look at it just like in junk. I don't look at the stats there. Uh, but talk about again, you have what needs to happen for Loki, and then you just have this Mockingbird working right into it. And really, the Moon Girl, this is the only place I loved her in. I loved Moon Girl in this build particularly because you can not only have a lot of cheap cards that maybe you stole with Mirage or Cable or whatever it might be. But in the same vein, you can build up the Devil Dinosaur and you can get Mockingbird. Now, you do need some things to go right sometimes, but it has always a gameplay and a game plan. And what it does best, in my opinion, is it allows you to have the other slots reserved for the, for the tech cards. And then you're sitting good. You've got kind of everything in your arsenal and you can copy Thanos' uh, deck and end up going over the top there. So that was my favorite uh, place outside of Patriot. You know, I was so scared for a sec. I thought we weren't going to hit our Moon Girl quota. And you, no, you no, I'm, girl? come on, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got a big old calendar here. It says uh, it had, what, six days since my last Moon Girl reference for me to, you know, set that back to zero. But you know what? Here's the important thing, though. You're allowed to because you you just had a Moon Girl in your deck, right? Your Loki deck, right? So, like, you're allowed to actually brag a little bit. Um, and the one thing I will say, though, about Loki, I think it's way better than statistically it's showing because everyone is using Mobius right now. Mobius and Mobius is everywhere for Mockingbird. It was everywhere for Pixie as well. And so, like, I think that Loki's catching strays right now because Mobius is so popular. And Mobius does have a very negative impact on Loki, straight up. The one thing I will say, though, is I think what really helped with Mockingbird was if you're playing a Loki deck, I think Loki is being used as, like, this, like, second out on occasion. We saw it, we saw it on Glenn's negative deck as well, right? Where it's, like, Loki is the backup plan. And so, like, let's say you go with the full shield setup, like, you're playing your cards down with your Quinjet um you don't have to loki and mockingbird actually works really well there and of course mockingbird works if top decked as well so very versatile but to your point loki surprisingly complex to play and i think that a lot of people miss that I, it's it's much more complex than it originally was at a three five <laughs> yeah three five it was just play loki and win i guess right but i think nowadays there's a lot more going on especially with mobius and mobius in the mix i have so much fun when i don't even know my own game plan going in and that's why i enjoy you know, that's why the meme's there, man. That's why Agent Coulson has, has my heart. I just love the deck because it's the ultimate version of it. Mirage, Cable, Coulson. You get so much of the, what do I have to work with? What are the tools I'm going to use to win? And then you now have Loki as that other thing. Be like, ah, I don't like the tools I got. Coulson gave me a Tuma and Sandman. Let's mix it up and, and try it again. And it's just a fun deck. It's so fun, Alex. Another thing worth mentioning when we talk about Mockingbird is the locations. It had so many synergistic locations, Savage Lands, you know, New York Park or whatever the heck it's called. What's the New York Park again? I can't. Uh, Central, Central, Central Park. Central Park. You have uh, everyone in New York, Manhattan. It's like, seriously, is this guy not like he's not know anything about the United States of America? What a silly Canadian. But yeah, so Central Park, uh, Monster. Uh, I was going to say Monsters, Inc. I'm all over the place right now. Anyways, so like, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. All those locations, I felt like we're really helping Mockingbird a lot. So I think this card was surprisingly well balanced. Uh, Cozy, I'll leave it to you to give your initial star rating. Yeah, we gave it a four star, I think, uh, when we when we let in. And honestly, I think that's where I have it. I think a four star, like he, it, it's it could be argued higher than that, but I feel like it's true home is Thanos, it's Loki, a little bit of Patriot, 
and then you can like flex it into a couple of decks because of its overall like reach of flexibility there probably like a four still is where where i feel like but it's a good card yeah without mobius and mobius it's a five star card like honestly mobius is really keeping in check it's definitely a four four and a half star definitely a card that is very very strong and uh talk about cards that are very strong we're gonna do two separate top 10 deck uh lists right now and we're gonna be talking about the x-men cards and we're gonna be talking about the avengers cards and coach we're gonna start with the x-men we're gonna do top 10 decks uh <laughs> decks top 10 cards we're not talking decks just the cards but you might be playing them in decks right now because we do have the event going uh you know as of recording and uh cozy let's start with the x-men by far my favorite of the x-men and uh the avengers event uh, i've been loving the x-men uh, we actually I, I released a video i released a deck that's currently running a 58 percent win rate across 25,000 games it's absolutely slapping and it's slapping with silver server once this event goes away the deck's terrible <laughs> it's really just taking advantage of the x-men synergy however what i will say is i've been loving it and i love my x-men and we have x-men 97 coming out within a few weeks isn't it yeah and they uh that i mean it looks like they definitely did a good job with it I, but then they released like the showrunner it uh, i don't know it's gonna be uh it's gonna be interesting i'm, I'm highly anticipating i know there's a lot of a lot of fans there so it's gonna be a delicate delicate region for people to uh, uh they're gonna love it or they're gonna hate it and i'm sure uh i'm sure i'm gonna love it dude 97 was my jam um i think uh overall yeah definitely the x-men was a bit better than the avengers that's why we'll probably give them a bit more time uh because anytime you have to do all in one location right like that just felt a little bit there's a lot of avengers there of course they left some off that could be debated in certain uh, circles that the mega marvel fans were heard loud and clear this week uh you want to start with honorable mentions yeah i mean for me i think the uh, honorable mentions for x-men have to include rogue and kitty pride neither reach our top 10 but like rogue i've had a ton of success with especially with the amount of ongoing cars that are present in the meta right now destroys tribunal destroys miss marvel uh feels like it does a great job stealing mobius and mobius as well um so i could play sarah for instance I've liked it. I've liked Rogue and Kitty Pride. I think is like, man, it used to be the best card in the game. It's just it's off its perch, but it's a good card. Yeah, I would go Negasonic is right on the cusp. I think it was harder to make this top ten. Alex and I were like, no, this should be in it, not this. And so we were uh, off on a couple of them. And Negasonic was uh, the card on my list. You know, I put it in that Patriot deck that that was doing okay. And it's because people just uh, don't respect her, man. People don't respect her. And then you put on top of that with Silver Surfer and uh, really good card. And then uh, Cable. Cable was the other one. Again, uh, just recently buffed up. I think he's great to steal, and he just made sense in giving you a, a potential alternate win condition, and so many people were playing X-Men Avenger cards. You probably got an X-Men from it, and then you were able to just roll with that. So I definitely liked him. But what do we have at number 10? So in this top 10s, by the way, we're not just talking about the event cards themselves. We're just talking about, in general, how we play them, archetype defining, et cetera, et cetera. And that takes us to our number 10 which is X-23. Now, X-23 and Destroy not necessarily benefiting too much from this event, but X-23 is one of the best one-drops in the game, one of the best X-Men in the game, one of the best Destroy cards in the game. You cannot argue that X-23 is not an absolutely remarkable card. Yeah, I mean, heck, I, I, maybe I waited the event too much here, and she should be high. I mean, she is just, she's just doing her role in Destroy, but that role is so high, and we've had this argument with a lot of cards, right? We're like, they bring so much to that one type, uh, now we are getting hope summers and other ways to boost up and get energy but definitely just an absolute ridiculous card to go higher than that uh but we love her uh moving on to nine yeah number nine it's uh it's ice man the man of ice and i gotta tell you i love this card it used to be one of the absolute top tier cards of marvel snap has fallen off a little bit i feel like we've had some power creep for poor little ice man here and uh you know spider ham perhaps sat on his perch for a bit and then spider ham got changed and etc but honestly i still like ice man and i don't know about you but i've had moments where i've played ice man on turn one and people just leave I'm like, oh, did I hit their Sarah or something? They just tilted out. Like, I don't know, right? You don't know. You don't know what they hit. But Iceman is definitely a, a fantastic card. Yeah, I, I I think he's still as good as he's been for a while. I think he the guy, he he serves his purpose, and it just feels good doing something on turn one sometimes. Okay, it just feels good getting him out there. You know you've done your deed. Uh, obviously, in balance and whatnot, he can get a bit more effective on that. Uh, but it outside of clearly maybe the last, he feels good to play probably turn three and down really good i think that's what can hurt him is when you draw them uh the power creep that you kind of mentioned i think are we're getting one cost cards that don't care when they're played more and more right and, and that can be can be tough obviously spider ham yeah definitely like him though he's a good card overall and very flexible which is probably what netted him the number nine 
Yeah, and again, Mobius on Mobius does have a negative impact on Iceman's viability as well when it's taking over the meta. Number eight is a card that, uh, honestly, when I was first doing this list, I would have taken it off, but Cozy's like, nah, 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 Alex, smart enough, bud. We gotta have this in there, and that's Beast. Beast is a card that has seen multiple changes, and uh, let's be honest, it, it basically carries an entire archetype, right? It, Beast Bounce is just, it's the card. It's Beast is Bounce, basically. And uh, it's a remarkably powerful card. The uh, It's been changed. I mean, the negative one cost the next turn, I think, really impacted it. We haven't seen as much Beast since that change, but still, still meta-defining, archetype-defining. It's a good card. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, Falcon and Beast together, why not? That, uh, that they are just the, the deadly duo. And I think people that were very big into balance uh, have said, hey, I kind of like him this way too. The two cost feels good. A whole cost reduction for a power that great, even though it does kick back is on reveal a little bit. Uh, very solid, very good. Well, let's go and stick with uh, the, the leader of the X-Men, who I, man, listen, okay? Uh, again, we said he could probably get buffed up a little bit. Professor X, though, is still doing what he does best. I think he feels pretty solid right now at where he's at. I mean, the guy, uh, just, dude, he's a game winner. Game winner, and, and he's very, very just punishing, right? Like, I don't know about you, but if you just forget to play, uh, you know, in a lane, you, you, you save it for the intern or whatever, and they end up slapping that on, it's uh, it's it's Cyanor for the lane. I just think his, his uh, effect is so unique, and uh, we're getting more cards now, starting to support him again. Uh, I think 5-2 could be a healthy balance, but then, uh, I don't know, maybe you lose the Ravona synergy. I mean, listen, I actually believe that he should probably go back to 5-3, considering War Machine's also coming out next week. Oh. Wouldn't surprise me if an OP OTA buffed him up. I, I I like, listen, it's a unique effect, but we're, we're getting a lot of opportunities to cheat that effect. Jeff does it. War Machine does it. Yeah. Uh, Miss Marvel has reach into it. I mean, Claw does it, but that's not really the same thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> but we have all these ways to mitigate it. I mean, obviously, Tribunal doesn't care about Professor X. I don't think he is what he used to be, and I feel like he can get buffed. We're getting a lot of cards, or not getting cards, but like the Nebulas, the Sunspots, like that's why he was in the high evil list for me. Like there's a lot of cards that just like, they continue to get good after UX, which is always solid too. But yeah, to your point, War Machine, I think Control is at a great spot right now. And War Machine is, is going to be a scary, scary card coming out. But yeah, definitely we got Pro X. Next up on the list of the top 10 is who? Number six is going to be Armor. Armor is one of those cards I think has a lot of capabilities. I know people are leaning towards Kyera, but I've actually been cutting Kyera from a lot of my decks and including Armor because it really has a negative impact on Destroy. Like it is a snap condition against Destroy and Destroy, even if it's kind of in the gutter a little bit, represents often between five and 10% of the meta at any given time. And that's kind of where it's sitting right now. And I, I like armor. It has a lot of utility, both offensively and defensively, naturally. Love the card. Yeah, I think uh, if you have a lot of, obviously, ones and sixes, go go Kyera. But it just that one cost difference is, is huge at times. Being able to play her out on the two curve feels good most of the time. She could be a location winner as well, like Death Domain, whatever. Like, you can go in there and really work on it. Uh, just such a damn good flexible card and uh she had a little bit of time outside the limelight but she's back magic comes in at number five and uh honestly i could even see this card sliding up higher one of my favorite cards in the game one of the most elegant changes they've ever made to a card it used to be one of the most broken cards in the game changing turn six into into limbo and then basically going to turn seven your opponent's like well i just did everything and now i'm screwed to this card's unplayable to actually hey it's playable it's good it's fair we like this card yeah, it feels like there's a good balance of like magic decks versus not magic decks. Like when there's too many, it's nothing but like the Legion and uh, like there's just so many cards that try to get rid of the magic. And, uh, you know, obviously right now we got the trap, you know, we got the uh, the high evil play, but uh, magic's fun. Definitely great. Doesn't add too much time to a match, uh, but definitely changes, changes up enough strategy. And uh, yeah, I'm all here for it. And number four is going to be a card that's often played alongside magic. That's Cyclops. Cyclops in and of its own is not very impressive, but in those high evolutionary shells, it's literally the, I mean, it is the card that crushes for that archetype. Cyclops really helps carry high evo. And of course the Hulk does too. Cyclops truly remarkable as an X-Men. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I just, I mean, they, they killed him off early in X3. He was terrible when the game came out. Like Cyclops has had a tough time in media and I'm glad that he's good. Like I just, I, I love him as a character. He is truly like, if someone were to say like, when you think X-Men, what do you think of? He's up there in the top three. I would say, oh yeah, Cyclops. Like, of course, he's very, very iconic 
and uh, he definitely makes this list. In the uh, animated series, it's basically the Cyclops show. Like, he is so integral to that team. So, yeah, Cyclops for sure. And that takes us to number three. And that is another X-Men, because that's what we're doing, <laughs> obviously. And it's Storm. Storm. Now, this has been a card that's kind of bounced back and forth in terms of meta relevance. Uh, when Move was super popular, we lost a little bit of Storm. But now Storm is making a comeback. Storm is legit cozy. Number three. Yeah, I think Storm is as good as Control isn't, which sounds super weird. But, like... When you're not having to worry about like Jeff's or like Miss Marvel's reaching in and getting uh, bonus points and whatnot, uh, but this is also a huge helper towards that. Uh, I love Storm, man. I, I can't, I can't not have Storm in my surfer list. I can't not have her in uh, a lot of lists where like even like Century and, and they can't get rid of the Void or fill up that lane for the Void. Like a lot of uses for her and cheap, cheap way to do it. Cheap way to make a Marvel Snap a two lane game and thus you can just ally. And you have the power in your hand, right? Like most games in Snap, or a good chunk of them, it's like they're playing in their location, you're playing in your location, and Storm is, is a huge benefit off that, I think. And also, let's not sleep on the fact that you are you do have some location control. The location correction is huge. Like I've been playing Storm on turn six, right? To prevent limbos or from whatever reason, right? And I think that, uh, I think it's a great card. I think it's great. I I've recently played Storm into a rickety bridge, right? Where I just basically canceled the rickety bridge and perfect. I played my cards there and the opponent's like, well, I only put like a two drop there, one drop there just to kind of put something there. And then like the Storm comes in and completely wrecks it, right? So I think the versatility of Storm is very important as well. Yeah, the definition of a card that you can play early and late. And anytime you have a card like that, it's like Mockingbird, <laughs> uh, it's, it's solid. Uh, that takes us to the top two. Yeah, we're in the top two. Now, our number two card is definitely a card you don't want to play late. It's one you want to play early, and that is going to be Sunspot. Uh, this has been a card that's been one of the absolute best one-drops in Marvel Snap since its inception. It used to be a 1-1. One, one, and We used to joke on the earlier Snapchats, like, whoa, Sunspot's just a 1-9, I guess. Like, the card is just remarkable. Uh, it since has been brought down a little bit, but I think the game has matured in a way where, like, you don't need to depend on Sunspot as much, but still an absolutely phenomenal card. Yeah, the inverse of She-Hulk, right? Like, it's easy to skip energy. It's, you know, there's so many times you don't get the Zabu on two, you get him on three, so you play him, then you can float to this. There's just, you never feel bad about it. He is going to get punished more with Red Hulk coming out, but he's a great card. Oh, 100% a great card. One of my absolute favorite in the game. And that takes us to our number one X-Men card. And, uh, I mean, listen, might be controversial, but it's the season pass card. It's Hope Summers. Hope Summers has had a definitely massive impact on the meta. It's a damn good card. Anytime you're getting additional power at the whim of playing into a location, you're going to be able to make use of it. It has benefited so many different archetypes. It goes into all different types of decks. Hope Summer is an absolute banger. When you said controversial, I'm like, I think she's firmly here. But yes, as far as like, it's a season pass card that's here. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, tough. Yeah, she's, she's so good. I just, I love what she does for deck design. Uh, really brings a lot to it. Um, you know, definitely going to be that that card that when she goes into Series 5 and she's in a future spotlight cash, like, it could be a, a rough... If that card's above a two-star, roll it. Doesn't matter. Uh, she's that good. I like how, just like myself, you have not upgraded the card yet because you're waiting for, like, the, the Pandar Season Pass one. It has, like, a Kim oh, yeah. Yacinto look to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been, like, usually, almost always, I at least, like, frame match it. This time, I'm like, no. I'm saving everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a Me good too. looking card. You don't even need to free match it. You can just pick whatever you want in the builder thing. That's Why right. would you just pick? You That's could have just right. picked a different one anyway. But anyways, yeah. I get you, Cozy. I see you there. Good good call there. Okay, so that's our top 10 X-Men from the top to the bottom. Number one, we have Hope Summers. Number two, it's Sunspot. Number three, it's Storm. Number four, Cyclops. Five, Magic. Six, Armor. Seven, Professor X. Beast coming in at nine. And then finally, we do have, uh, I just read that all wrong. Beast was number eight, Iceman was nine, and 10 was X-23. Good counting there, Alex. Well done. It's not like I'm a school teacher or anything. And that takes us to the top 10 Avengers card, Cozy. Uh, we are going to start at number 10, and we have Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man, uh, what I'll say on that list on X-Men, uh, I think X-23, I think probably high. Looking at that list again, like, eh, I probably want her a bit higher uh, probably on that, better than beast yeah yeah probably like in the halfway mark there uh but either way uh the adventure side i, I found it a little bit easier especially the top end is like yeah these are definitely the the strongest spider-man coming in probably made was the toughest decision was this bottom here of this barrel there's like ant-man who is is a one five now like okay you know that's ridiculous um i i think spider-man is, is good where he's at uh definitely still you know 
it, oh man, almost feels like a cheaper cannonball in ways, right? Like you're moving the card. Yeah, you're moving this, but it's it's a three cost, and I Spider Man's great, always has been. And keep in mind now, the change to Elsa improves Spider Man because yep. now Spider Man gets the buff and stuff because they reverted that those changes. So yeah, Spider Man definitely a great card. Love the uh, the impact that it has. As we move on to number nine, and that's Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil might be a surprise to a lot of people, but I was recently playing Daredevil in my uh, my Galactus and uh, Nihilus deck. I, I love it, honestly, as Cozy shows off his God Split. And I got to tell you, it's a great card, and I feel like Daredevil is criminally underplayed. Uh, Daredevil is, I think people have the misconception that if you're like, you're good at snap, you don't need Daredevil. And I don't think he does that role. Like, yeah, you can probably know what they're going to play. It doesn't matter. Like, he just helps so much. I'd like to see more cards that benefit off him, right? Like Hobgoblin's huge. You obviously have the Guardians of the Galaxy. Mantis, there I say. No, but like it, it is, uh, it's a card I'd like to see more synergy with, but super undervalued, extremely, especially like even in competitive play. It's just a massive advantage knowing exactly where and what they're going to play. And the snap equity you get from Daredevil's huge, yeah. like being able to snap on turn five, which is a pivotal turn where you can then flip the board state and then go into turn six, your opponent like, oh man, like I can't actually do anything. You've doubled the stakes of the game. Like you double the stakes of the game on turn five with the information you need to punish your opponent. You know what I mean? And so like competitively, I think Daredevil is fantastic. And uh, I can't get over the split cozy. Dude, can you yeah. please do an audio read for us? Oh, guys, I sometimes it's your lucky day. And I just I had a good amount of good amount of splits. And he is one of those that just have like great variants regardless. And the watercolored variant of of the uh, it's actually Alex Coach's uh, body build. So it's, it's it just you do what you want with your visuals there. Uh, I don't even know. It kind of looks like he's got like organs on the outside. It's like less abs and more like the large intestine. Um, but it is red, just like the crackle behind him, popping behind a gold border and a gold back. I, I, it doesn't get better. He literally has an 18 pack. Yeah, you're right. It looks completely weird. I don't know. Now that you, I'm staring at him, I'm like, wait, you're right. Like, I don't know what's going on with those abs. There's something going on there. But yeah, Daredevil, absolute beauty. And that takes us to number eight, which is going to be the vision. Visions coming in at number eight. The only other one to casually lift Mjolnir. One of my favorite scenes in MCU. Um, Vision. Cozy. We talked about him with Cannonball. Like, why play Cannonball when you can play Vision? And I still stand by that. Yeah. Uh, just uh, it's one of the best feeling cards to play on turn five, right? Like, because you get the movement in there. It's not the worst thing to not play him. Sometimes there's other options and there's just so much locations that you love. We, we've talked about it. Hell, I won a game the other day because i followed the coach rule of when in doubt they're just not going to move vision right so like i just i just accepted that I'm like they're not moving vision i played around it and there you go um yeah i think he's a fen phenomenal card and uh you know they in in in, in game they had to or infinity war they had to kill him off early they had to at least they had to wound him early corvus like stabs him because if they had vision it'd be over like vision's just he's he's op he's stupid good this is like the fourth spoiler you've said. Dude, like, that's last... like Darth Vader is Luke's dad. Like, you know, it's... Bro, like, come it's on. Oh, yeah, my listen, God. Listen. 80 dislikes on the video. There is a, there's a, uh, a statue of limitations uh, as far as spoilers go. And, and I feel like give or take 30 years for that one. Give or take 10 years for that one. I don't know. Sorry, guys, if I ruined it. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. But uh, that vision is truly remarkable. Just like number seven... A brand new card to Marvel Snap, and that's Mockingbird. We actually decided Mockingbird comes in at number seven. And uh, I mean, you could consider it higher, and it wouldn't surprise me if it drifts higher in the future, but there are such absolute bangers on this list. There are some Avengers that have been meta staples for so long. Mockingbird doesn't quite compete there, but it's still a phenomenal card. Yeah, we spent the full subject on it. We won't say much more, but uh, we didn't want full recency bias, so this is where she's at. Number six, the attorney at law, it's She-Hulk. Shield comes in at number six, one of the most versatile cards in Marvel Snap. Another beautiful split there from Cozy Snap. Cozy, why do you like She-Hulk? It was tough to even put her this low, man. Uh, it just She works in every deck, man. She works in every single deck, pretty much. Just feels good to get out early, get out late. You know, maybe you only play a two cost on turn five, and then you're like, oh, well, that, they just must have had nothing, and then you're able to really capitalize off, off it. You have Shuri, you have everything. I love her. Great card. Yeah, absolute phenomenal card and uh, another phenomenal card. Number five, Miss Marvel. Used to be a 415. Now it's only it's only 414 cozy. Damn, I can't believe it. Miss Marvel continues to be absolutely remarkable. Naturally, the condition has changed since the original launch. 
Doesn't matter though, this card is still a very powerful card. Cozy, what are your thoughts on Miss Marvel? I play her a lot less than I used to. I can, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't have, and it could be that whole thing we've talked about where like when cards are good for so long, like we've kind of like edged them out of our decks. Um, I love that she has a comparable kind of free to play more option of, of Omega Red. Um, and, and, and sometimes I prefer him. I'll be honest, just because of the condition. Uh, but just, yeah, she's where she's ranked for a reason. Incredible power. There's something to be said about power that is an actual power too. It's just, it's a great ability to have for several reasons, right? Like that faux power on negative zone, things like that. Just, just good on Jotunheim all around. Yeah. And of course it'll reach into locations locked down by Professor X or whatever. Um, I do agree that I've been playing less Miss Marvel and I feel like that's often to my detriment because when I add her back to the deck, I'm like, oh yeah, this card's still amazing. Yeah. Like, honestly, like we're kind of, we have this bias of remembering what the card used to be like. Yeah. Same thing with Kitty Pride, like the, that OG original Kitty Pride. It's so hard to like forget about it. And Miss Marvel was exactly that, completely earth shatteringly good. And um, ultimately it has been impacted negatively by the, the nerf. But the nerf had to happen. It was too damn good. So Miss Marvel does come in at number five for us. At number four, we have Kang the Conqueror, his younger version. <laughs> I just need to get people kind of sweating there a little bit. Yeah. And I, some people might not realize this, but Iron Lad is actually Kang the Conqueror. I didn't. I thought he was, I thought, uh, uh, really? I should know yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I was reading the comics. I was reading the, uh, the Kang comics and Iron Lad, not this particular variant, but Iron Lad actually is in the comics. It's him younger coming back to defeat himself. Oh, I should have known that. I feel like I knew like a lot of Ronai, uh, a lot around him but not uh that i should have i started doing like marvel marvel lore in my in my intros of new cards and uh that was after after land but there you go you learn something new every day and i'm sure someone in the comments will have much more specific thoughts about my very general assessment of the ancestry of iron lad but uh i cozy i gotta give you credit this is one of those cards that you were so high on for so long before the release i remember doing our topic on your side of the snapchat discussing iron lad i was like oh, that seems pretty good and you're like no this card is going to do things to the meta, and you've been proven correct, my friend. It's never been nerfed. It's never been buffed. It's been just right, if not slightly overtuned for forever. It's a damn good card. I caught a lot of heat. The next thumbnail I had was like, Iron Lad is S tier, and I remember getting a lot of heat, a lot of, a lot of Twitter, a lot of, a lot of good stuff out there, and uh, overall, uh, yeah, I just, it, there's something about the draw mechanics, the way it works, and one of the better cards to play late, right? Because you get to see what you have left else in the deck. We've all been there. You got the 50-50 coin flip. And, and and a lot of the times, you know, if you have bad RNG like me and Alex do, you know, you've got like Patriot and Dr. Doom, let's say, left in the deck. And you're like, okay, I'll take either of those, right? Like it, both can work. And so that's what feels great about him. He makes cards that with not a lot of power way better. And then cards with OP abilities, with more power, whatever it might be, awesome as well. So yeah, I love him. I have to correct you. In that situation, when we're playing Patriot and Doctor Doom, Alex forgets that he got Korg rocked mm. and ends up hitting the Vibranium rock. Vibranium mine, yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens yeah. all the time. <laughs> that's, that's how I actually yeah. play the card. Uh, a random thing while you're talking, I kind of my mind drifted ever so slightly. Is is he actually an Avenger? Like, what is this? Like, why is he an Avenger? Um, you, I mean, you're the one dropping the knowledge bomb of King the King the Conqueror. So, uh, yeah, I, why I, would Kang ever be an Avenger? Okay, someone in the comments, please explain why. Iron Lad is actually considered an Avenger because I don't know. I've read, I've read a bunch of the comics, not all of them naturally, but I'm kind of confused with that. But regardless, that takes us number three. And number three is most certainly an Avenger. There's no question about that. And that is the biggest, meanest, greenest MF you'll ever see. And that's Hulk. Hulk coming in at number three was just at the top of our tier list there. Absolutely remarkable card. Vanilla Hulk was kind of sad for a while, Cozy really sad card and then you get that evil hulk and oh my gosh is an absolute beauty not much more to say we talked about him earlier in the podcast and uh he big big green angry power i wish he was a little better outside of evo i'll say that at yeah. times uh i try to make him work in patriot i'm like ah just can't get it done but yeah hulk number three what's number two number two is the man of iron cozy and this is one of those cards i like honestly we originally started with him at number one and another gods but cozy how dare you um Honestly, like Iron Man is such a good card. Can you imagine if Iron Man, this card with this effect was released today as a, it's like not a season pass card, but like <laughs> imagine that too. Imagine it was released as like a spotlight cash. How crazy, do you imagine like how crazy we'd be going about this card? Nice. It is such a good, amazing card. Easily one of the best in the game. And you get it in your starting deck. It was tough not to put him at number one. I think you guys aren't going to be too shocked at what number one is, but that's because number one is a firm foundation in Snap, whereas Iron Man is 
is a pretty big important cog into the machine of a lot of decks but uh yes the absolute shad of snap number one alex uh just uh, da, 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 da. i have nothing more to say outside of it's him yeah it's him and i'll let you lead him in because uh i was willing to drop him down but you're like no alex you, you know he has to be number one so cozy give us give us the business yeah i think we both were like iron man one and then i was like oh, how do we how though how do we not put shung as one I, at the end of the day he's just whether it's competitive play casual play every deck you look at it and you're like i uh, could use shung chi or like if you don't have like one tech card the deck is overall for the most part a little bit worse so i, I definitely think shung chi is 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 the best avenger uh right now in marvel snap he's the most core avenger and i don't think we're too shocked about it and uh the popularity rate uh speaks to it most played card in the game it's the most played card in the game and honestly one of the highest cube rate cards in the game as well despite the fact that it has like a what 40 something percent play rate if not maybe even higher um people often play like shun chi doesn't exist like i'm just like okay you played you ramped blob out on turn five like what do you think is going to happen now yeah you, am i going to try and move him no <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to try and cannonball him? No. I'm going to punch him directly in the chops with Shang-Chi. It's, and you know what though? It's important. It's important that this card exists because without it, vertical power is everything, right? Vertical power is everything, but Marvel Snap is more complex than that because this card exists. And that takes us, my friend, to the Snapchat mailbag. Question number one comes in from Dr. Loves Jess, and it reads, uh, what four cards would you guys say make up the Mount Rushmore of Marvel Snap? Could be any of the cards, new or old. I would love to hear your thoughts. Oh, man. It's like, it's a tough question because, like, we have our Mount Rushmores, right? But then, like, the Snap ones. And the Snap ones, I feel like, are kind of obvious in some senses, right? I mean, Shang-Chi, we just talked about him. We anchor him on there. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we actually discussed prior. We we're like, okay, what are the four cards that have been consistent through Marvel Snap's history? Not just flash in the pants. The ones that you've been able to be like, okay, that card's good and it's always been good. Sean Chi definitely won. He's on the Mount Rushmore. Cozy, the man with the gauntlet. Thanos. Yeah, uh, I mean, Sean Chi and Thanos could pretty much sum up about 80% uh, of the decks right now. So definitely those two up there. And I think the last two could be a lot of them. I think there's a lot of cards in here. And I think... We even had some back and forth like, ah, but this one, but this one. Dr. Doom seems like he is pretty firmly in there. Uh, just, again, catch-all. Great, you know, one knock to Iron Lad a little bit is you kind of have to put Iron Man, Dr. Doom, maybe Blue Marvel. So then, like, the deck gets smaller and smaller, but that's because Dr. Doom has such a crazy ability. If you get him on the car, you snap away, and you get a cube to go, and, and that's it. But, yeah, he's definitely the third head and the last one alex what is it last one i i put up a fight for magneto i think that magneto's always been good it's never been nerfed it's never been buffed it's always been relevant i think it's absolutely crushing it right now by the way i think it's such a great card and uh as a canadian i had to look up how many heads were on mount rushmore uh cozy did inform me that it is four and so to sum up we do have thanos shan chi doc doom and magneto let us know your four in the comments down below and then we go to next question from holes and it reads if second editor were to add a guild or clan feature to Marvel Snap, what specific features would you like to see upon its launch? I believe the ability to chat, share decks, and possibly some sort of clan goal to get a reward would be nice. I mean, yeah, they are adding it, right? We have confirmation that that's definitely uh, most likely coming. Um, I think altogether, A, just um, being able to see like Alex Coach's top three most played cards that month or of all time or whatever is really unique and fun. Being able to have access into his collection and looking at his different variants or maybe he has like his top three variants uh, pinned on his profile really cool as well obviously a basic chat function is, is something i would like to see and then yeah man goals dude like hey play like missions just keep it simple missions we already have but you get something as working as a team what you're saying here and it's funny because you're talking more about like a massive profile overhaul which i think would be super cool i don't know if that would be in the scope of the original launch but i do like what you're saying that would be super cool I was leaning much towards... Okay, so in Dota 2, they had they launched the clan-based system. It was actually part of the battle pass for the, the Invitational originally. And then they kept it because people liked it. And the way it worked was basically you have like... The whole go the whole guild has a mission, like Shang-Chi, 45 enemies this week. And then if you do it, everyone's progress counts. And then what you get is like a, a credit reward or whatever. You could have something that's like, oh, you know, maybe you uh, play... a. 10,000 power worth of cards and you do that together just by playing the game 
I think that's pretty cool. But I'm sure, you know what, Second Dinner, if they're good at one thing, it's designing a fun game. I'm sure the mode's going to just absolutely slap. Yeah, I think the thing to, to be careful of is Snap is a very casual game. And a lot of the times in mobile games, when we see clans, it's it, the, the developers know what they're doing. They it, it creates almost this structure that is now all of a sudden like anxiety and like Alex, you better you better get your battles in and it, I hate that. I absolutely don't keep snap what it is. Do not have it, you know, where we've got like managers of, of clans that are checking up with people. Why don't you play your Shung Chi five times a day? Like I don't want to see anything like that. It's a careful balance, but playing things together, doing things together is always more fun and, and definitely would love to see that. You're absolutely right. That reminded me. Uh, okay, this is the teacher coming out. But like I years ago, there was this a story about a school, an elementary school. So like this was like grade five and six kids. And they had a clash, uh, clash of clans clan. And they had a minimum spend in the clan. And they would like publicly shame each other if they weren't spending enough money. And it turned into this big thing. And like, you're right. It kind of ruined the experience for a lot of people. So hopefully, I don't think it, Marvel Snap's obviously not going to do that. It just kind of brought it up. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember reading a story about some super toxic clash oh, yeah. of clans clanning that was occurring. So hopefully Marvel Snap can dodge that. And that brings us to our final question of the day. And it comes in from Andrew and it reads, what do you both do when you feel yourself getting tilted? I know Alex breaks out the black label, but what else? Personally, I've started to do a fist bump at the start of every match. It helps me not want to mash the Miss Marvel emote if my opponent beats me. And uh, just so you know, Cozy, that's a reference to my stream with Pixie. We'll say it didn't start very well and I needed some liquid courage to continue. And I ultimately came across my favorite Pixie deck which was a Pixie High Evolutionary deck from yours truly. So thank you so much, Cozy. You saved my tilt that day. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, man, I'm not much of a tilting guy. Uh, I like it all that much. Not, it doesn't make me, you know, any any different or better. Than whatever. There's no right or wrong. Uh, I just, I don't get tilted that often. I'd have to, I get tilted the most when I make, and now the intern thing has happened. So that makes it, but when I used to do, you know, get a, get a play in before the game, and like, I would just get super mad. But in life, I'm more on the positive side. So yeah, definitely not too much tilting. But if I am, you know, making a play or whatever, uh, d take a break. It's probably usually the best, you know, to take a, take a lap, if you will. Uh, and uh, Or switch up decks, switch up something to a bit more of a fun deck, maybe. Go like a Pixie. Uh, I know this is, you know, you, you're not crazy on Mr. Negative, but like that style of play where you're just like, all right, let's get Jane on five. I got the Mr. Negative out. And then you kind of have some fun with it uh, would be my, my, my suggestion. Yeah, for me, it's like, honestly, I just love playing the game that, like, I just don't tilt very easily. I've been on tilt before, but, like, I just cue the next match. Like, it's really that simple, right? And, uh, like, it, for me, like, honestly, it's just, I just love the game enough that, like, I find myself never too upset. And uh, I like the idea of playing a deck that you really thoroughly enjoy, but... I think that what tilts a lot of people out is fixating on specific goals that like make numbers like rank and stuff the priority. Don't do that. Like just set your expectations for a goal that's achievable, right? Like for me, I love splitting cards. So I like getting enough boosters for specific types of cards and that's how kind of I play. And you know what? When I'm playing for fun and I'm collecting boosters and I'm playing archetypes I want to learn better, like for instance, I've been playing some Phoenix Force not because I'm trying to win, but because I'm trying to get better at Phoenix Force so I can be much more informed when we have these types of conversations. That's the goal. And you know what's funny, Cozy? I'm gaining rank. I'm just playing the game, and I'm like, oh, look, I'm higher rank than I was before. When I lose, I don't care, right? I, me and you, we both snap for content for the memes, right? We do all that stuff because <laughs> at the end of the day, it's a game, and the game is meant to be fun. So if you're tilting, walking away from it's never a problem, right? Walk to Costco. Walk to Wise Costco. man once said, Get a 12 right? pack. walk to Costco. But at the end of the day, make sure you're having fun and setting some reasonable goals for yourself. And that takes us to the end of this week's Snapchat. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us this week. And once again, if possible, leave us a review on your platform of choice. And we'll see you on that next Snapchat episode.